Hello, my name is Marcus Brandt. I'm the head of uh, the International Idea Program in Myanmar. And we are here today with uh, Roger Schotten, who is uh, a renowned expert on fiscal decentralization in Asia and beyond. We want to take uh, an opportunity today to talk about uh, fiscal decentralization in the broader context of constitutional design in Myanmar for a new federal democratic future as is outlined in the Federal Democracy Charter that was adopted two years ago by the democracy movement in Myanmar. International IDEA runs a program called Building Federal Democracy in Myanmar and we have uh, had a number of workshops uh, and seminars on decentralization, local governance and fiscal decentralization and Roger has uh, been one of our contributors to uh, these discussions. And we today want to go a bit more in depth about the context of uh, in which fiscal decentralization is designed and that some of the lessons learned, especially from other countries in the Asia Pacific region. Roger, thank you very much for joining uh, us today. And uh, we've had many conversations over the years uh, on this fascinating subject already in Nepal uh, and also in Myanmar. And I would like to start with uh, inviting you to tell a little bit about how you got here to this point. Like you've been working for more than 30 years uh, in different countries after your studies in Oxford, uh, coming here to eventually being based in Thailand, but working in many countries in, in, in Asia, uh, always with a specific angle on uh, fiscal decentralization and, and reforms related to that. Can you just say a little bit about how you got into this and uh, and what your path was to, to the experience that you have on this subject now? Thanks, Marcus, and thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, well, look, I, I've, um, as you said, I've been working on um, on these issues now for actually more than over 40 years, and I started working on rural development uh, programs across Africa and Asia, as I say, over 40 years ago. But after a number of years working on these programs, it became apparent that they were not having the impact that they should have had, largely because they, these programs were divorced from government and local government in particular. So at one point we decided, I was working with the UN at the time, to, to make a deliberate shift and to start collaborating with local governments in Africa and in Asia, um, to have them be the the hosts, the the key stakeholders in these rural development programs, so to be to be sure that they would take them forward in the future and thereby ensure their sustainability. So that's where my interest in local government and decentralization started. Um, and so over the past 10, 15, 20 years, I've been working on this sort of um, on these local government financing, fiscal decentralization issues around South, Southeast, East Asia. Um, and in Myanmar, uh, I started working there in 2016, um, initially doing some research with the Asia Foundation and the Ministry of Planning and Finance, doing research on, the, on how the 2008 constitutional provisions for subnational government were panning out and what some of the issues and challenges were in those arrangements. So um, it, it was extremely interesting, rewarding work that we did together, and it all also involved quite a lot of training work with Ministry of Planning and Finance staff. Mm. And then uh, latterly, I was then involved with UNDP's program for township democratic local governance, which, um, as, you, as, I'm, as you know, Marcus, was all about supporting township-level governance financing, planning and budgeting in Mon and um, Bago, uh, Mon State and Bago region. All that, of course, sadly had to end on the 1st of February 2021. Mm. So you clearly have a lot of uh, background, <coughs> not only in Myanmar, but in the wider region. And it's interesting that you come basically from the development background. And uh, like many in the UN, having discovered the importance of governance and governance institutions and uh, not the uh, basically separating development issues from governance and w which are in other, way, other words means political issues. Uh, and this is also clearly 
uh, recognized in the uh, Agenda 2030, where uh, Goal 16 speaks about effective, accountable and transparent institutions at all levels. And that, of course, includes, uh, of course, the most importantly, the local level of government. And so come zooming in a bit more about so what is local governance about and how can a generalist who hasn't uh, got much background in this try to make sense of what is important to look at. Myanmar finds itself in a situation where it is basically back to the drawing board of a constitutional design that should be federal, uh, but uh, the local level of governance has so far been not really very fully developed uh, in Myanmar, and we may get back to that uh, in a few minutes. But can you just say sort of what is the basic questions that we need to ask to understand uh, fiscal decentralization, or let's say the the, the, the where the where the the power uh, lies, where the money comes from and goes to, and how do we make sense of local governance in a, from a fiscal decentralization perspective, in your opinion? Well, let's first of all just say a word about fiscal decentralization. Um, as I think we all know, there are the three dimensions of decentralization: as the political element, uh, the dimension of decentralization which is the one most people talk about usually. But then there are the two, if you like, more technical dimensions, the administrative side and the fiscal side, which tend to get less attention, but are nonetheless um, equally important for the success of any political decentralization program. Fiscal decentralization is all about determining the responsibilities of lower level governments, whether they be state, township level, I mean, obviously this depends on the national context, but the responsibilities of subnational governments, and particularly their spending responsibilities, and on the, on the other hand, how these spending responsibilities will be financed. So fiscal decentralization is about, is, is about these sets of issues. If they are not properly um, determined, what you then have is a system of local government, subnational government, where governments do not have meaningful responsibilities or do not have adequate finance. Services then do not get delivered locally. The citizenry uh, gets frustrated and loses interest in engaging with local governments. And so um, it, uh, determining the, the right fiscal decentralization framework is key to any successful decentralization program. And when, you, <clears throat> when we talk about decentralization, we still think of local government, governments or local governance institutions as part of the state structure. They are basically the lowest tiers, lowest co sort of components of a central, still something that is a central state structure. So to what extent does autonomy and self-governance come in here? And to what extent are local governance, governments just implementing central state agendas and, and policies? And to what extent do they have their own, let's say, power to decide things by themselves? And in what way does, does do fiscal and financial issues come into this question? You're, you're, you're pointing now to one of the key challenges. Uh, and there is always a balance in any country, in any local government, local government system, there is always a balance between allowing local governments and the communities that elect these local governments and interact with these local governments, between allowing them a sufficient degree of local choice, local autonomy, local independence in certain areas, but recognizing that in other areas, and we're talking about service delivery here, that in other areas, the center needs to give some direction. So, for example, in many countries, you, you, uh, local governments are allowed to are, um, manage, deliver certain services which are devolved and for which have financing is provided, um, where local governments can, can pretty well can choose both the standards of service delivery, the, the which communities will be benefiting this year, which communities will benefit next year, and so on. Whereas there may be other services like vaccination, for example, which need to be rolled out on a fairly standardized basis and of which you do not want local governments to be choosing too much. So then there need to be more strings attached to those services. So just to say that in, in any system, you will have a mix of functions um, of which more or less local freedom is allowed. 
and corresponding to that, a mix of funding arrangements which allow more discretion over over some spending functions, but much less discretion over others, like, like for example, the vaccination um, vaccination campaigns. And how does this interplay with the question of whether a country is federal or not? Ah, well, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, the principles of fiscal decentralization, I think, apply across the board to all countries, whether they're unitary or federal. The difference, I think, between a, a, a unitary um, a country with a unitary constitution and a country with a federal constitution is that the specific arrangements where we have a, where you have a multi-level government system, where you have a center, a federal center, where you have states and where you have governments within the states. In a federal system, you are generally allowing the state level a fair amount of discretion in choosing the particular arrangements it wants with its local governments in regard to their spending responsibilities, how they're going to be funded, etc. In a unitary country, um, you would expect a more uniform arrangement whereby all states pretty much adopt the same arrangements with their respective local governments. Um, however, the line is not a very hard one here because you do have some unitary countries like Vietnam or China where on the financing side, on the fiscal decentralization side of things, it so happens that the, sub, the, the first tier of subnational government, namely the provinces in China or in Vietnam, are allowed a lot of freedom to decide their arrangements with their local governments in those provinces. So in many respects, both Vietnam and China look like federal countries, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they are, of course, unitary. Mm -hmm. So a variation of uh, designs and models is a common thing, not only in federations, but also in formerly unitary systems. And uh, can, the, the, it allows local government to be adjusted to, to local specific local circumstances. <clears throat> Absolutely. Of course, this is what we would want to see in, in, in Myanmar as Myanmar, Myanmar moves forward to a federal... But that was not the case, of course, under the 2008 constitution, because until now, in the previous decades, the state structure was not only centralized, but also very uniform and standardized. So there was basically no degree of local variation possible in, in the Myanmar context until now. Is that correct? Th that, I would say that is correct um, uh, uh, legally, though in fact, and I think if we go back, I mean, look, looking back at how the 2008 constitution worked out at subnational level, one of the issues is that the, the legal framework was not never very properly, very well developed. So you had Schedule 2 in the constitution which determined the functions of states and regions, very vague and incomplete and never followed up by any organic local government law or finance law which might have more clearly defined those functions, as a result of which different states and regions quite often interpreted those provisions differently. So you had an in practice sort of variation, mm. the way things worked out, even though legally speaking, in the jury terms, the things should have been the same. I guess that is the case in all systems that you know, what is written in the law and then the constitution is one thing and then another completely different set of questions is how things are actually implemented. In, in, indeed, indeed. And I think one of the lessons we learn looking at, at uh, fiscal decentralization initiatives around Asia and elsewhere is the importance of a clear, well-developed legal regulatory framework. Um, we see in Nepal, for example, uh, a lot of time and effort was invested in, around the development of the, the federal constitution in Nepal, around also developing a whole body of laws and regulations, I think some 20 or more, which clearly spelt out the who does what and how arrangements at province and local government level in Nepal. If there are no, if there is not that sort of clarity, then you leave, you leave things to the choice of local officials and local representatives, which may go the way you want them to go or may not go the, the way you want them to go. Mm. <clears throat> And, and relatedly, I think another issue which is often forgotten is the um, is the need to, to to continually revise and clean up pre-existing legislation. Because another feature, I think, of the 2008 constitution in Myanmar was that a lot of older laws were left in place, unchanged, and so a lot of local officials at states and regions were often not quite sure quite sure which which legal which 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 legal text they were supposed to be following, because in some cases. The provisions of Schedule 2 
or Schedule 5 in the Constitution were not consistent with older laws in mm. regard to, for example, some of the taxes that states and regions were supposedly allowed to levy. So local officials were left a little bit a little bit in, in a bind as to how, to how to act. So I guess the clarity and systematic nature of the regulatory framework is an important ingredient for effective institutions. And that is something we often don't see in practice. Indeed, indeed. Uh, it, it's a sort of boring technical exercise, but which needs to be done. Uh, uh, but you see in a number of countries across Asia, the problems resulting when, when attention is not given to this, yes. Mm. <clears throat> Let us talk about the Federal Democracy Charter and the way in which it outlines already a, a system of decentralization, not only to the state level, but also what could be future local government uh, level structures. Uh, what do you make of what we see there, of uh, how the designers of the Federal Democracy Charter have uh, laid this out, and what would be the open questions that still need to be worked out? Well, I think I mean, what one sees in the Charter, and it's very welcome, are a number of key principles already reflected there around the importance of subsidiarity, the importance of separating the functions of the future federal level from the state level, um, the importance of um, there being a, a, an equalization, a fiscal equalization mechanism put in place to ensure that different states or, or regions, if there are still regions, are, are kept uh, you know, in equity. And that, importantly, that there also be a, 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 a commission um, a, or a committee formed which will allow regular consultation between the levels. That is a key, I think, will be a key issue. So all of this is, are, are excellent principles, but obviously there are an awful lot of details <laughs> um, which will need to be, to be, to be worked out, uh, and that will, of course, take time and a lot of consultation. What are these areas where things need to be worked out? Firstly, obviously, um, the nature of local government within the states. That is a bit of a blank at the moment, as far as I, I am aware, Clearly, the, the, the configuration of local government within each of the states may look quite different, and this, is, of course, is the point of, 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 of a future um, you know, b b being a federal, a federal um, having a federal constitution. <coughs> Nonetheless, <coughs> um, there will need to be clarity sooner rather than later, I would think, about the nature, about at what level within the states there be constituted some form of local government with an elected body, its own administration, to which functions and finances can be assigned. <coughs> One thinks, of course, of the township, but that might not necessarily be appropriate in all parts of the country. Um, the lack of which, of course, the lack of any government at township level uh, under the 2008 constitution, I think we saw in the work that we did, as I referred to earlier, as being a major problem in, in um, in the effective and efficient delivery of public services at local level. And, and Can you uh, <clears throat> just stop here for a moment? <clears throat> so when we, the townships were, have been the basic unit of local administration for Myanmar for generations. Why can we say that there was no local government? So how did the townships not uh, live up to being a local government? Well, Townships, um, um, uh, as you know, Marcus, were not given any formal government status in the 2008 constitution. They were just a tier of administration. So they were not, it was not possible to make them budget and financing entities in their own right. They were simply emanations of this, their respective state region governments. All what one had I'm not sure if they're still functioning or not, but when, when, at least until 2021, all that one had were the Township Planning Implementation Committees and previously other development committees which were, I think, were suspended in, uh, after the, um, the entry of the NLD, um, in, 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 take, after the NLD took, took over government in 2016. Those were suspended. So all that one had were these TPICs chaired by the Township Administrator, but they had a very weak role all they were they could do since the township didn't have its own budget each year all they could do was to send up proposals for spending up to their state and region government so what does that mean i mean that 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 looks like it might be okay but since each state this each township no townships were not given a a, a budget each year 
They had every interest, each township, to send a long, long list of proposals in all their sectors, roads and irrigation and electricity, etc. Far more than was ever going to be funded. So what, what you saw at, um, at state regional level was the arrival of long, long, long lists of proposals. And I remember the finance, the head of finance in Chin State uh, uh, saying, saying, look, you know, we have here 10 times more proposals coming in than we can possibly finance. What does that mean? It means that 90% of what is formulated at township level and arrives on the desks at, at, at state regional level has to be rejected. Time is wasted in preparing these proposals. Officials at state regional level, really, in the time they have, with the knowledge they have, are unable to make a sensible selection of the 10% that can be afforded. Mm. So you get what is effectively a very inefficient and ineffective planning and budgeting arrangement. And probably also a risk for arbitrary and uh, decisions not based on objective criteria. Uh, there simply isn't the time <clears throat> even with the best will in the world, even with all the PhDs mm. sitting around these desks mm. in, in Hakka, in Chin State, for example, or elsewhere, there's no way they could make a sensible selection of mm. those. So all of which to say, had the townships been allowed to make their own selections, had the townships been told, next year you will have X billion mm. chat to spend, then they can start making their own sensible priorities. And long-term planning. And long-term planning as well. Yes. And that makes it, of course, also more transparent and accountable to the local population. What would you say is the role uh, of transparency and accountability in the functioning of a local government? Well, transparency and accountability, of course, are key. I mean, without that, then all the suspicions of political decision-making, favoritism come into play. Uh, you know, one sees that not only in Myanmar, one sees that everywhere, really. I mean, unless there is light shed on decisions and clear criteria for why decisions were taken, then suspicions are aroused. And indeed, suspicions may often be justified. And very often, the wrong, in this case, budgeting, planning and budgeting decisions are taken. So public monies are not spent as effectively and efficiently as they should be. And since public monies are very scarce in poor countries like Myanmar, this is a, a tragedy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Now, if we look at another country, poor and uh, underdeveloped in the region that has actually gone through a constitution building process and uh, significant decentralization reform that you also know, Nepal, uh, what would be the lessons learned from the Nepali process of designing local government that Myanmar could learn from? Well, Marcus, I mean, you, you, you know Nepal, I think, much better than I do, but I mean, my understanding from what has happened in Nepal the last 15 or so years is that a lot of consultation and compromise was, was required between all the different interest groups and ethnic groups and, and political parties. That perhaps that is a given. Um, a lot of effort and thought, as I said earlier, was put into the technical groundwork around, <clears throat> and we come back here to the specifics of fiscal decentralization, a lot of technical work was put into the groundwork of figuring out what functions, what spending functions should best be given to the province, these, these new provinces, and to the local governments within those provinces. And um, if, I, if, I, if I'm not wrong, I think in that process, um, a number of working committees were established. Public services were, were scrutinized very carefully, and I think they they unbundled, I think, over a thousand government spending functions and looked carefully at each one on the basis not only of subsidiarity concerns, but also other basic economic criteria, and, and assigned appropriate responsibilities uh, both to um, to the provinces and the local government, and all that was done after the the constitution was already written or designed. The constitutional principles had been laid out. Yes, and then this unbundling took place yes. more as a yes. bureaucratic yes. exercise. Yes, and was then reflected in legislation. So what you have as a result of that are a set of functions assigned to these local governments, um, urban and rural at the local level, a set of functions to the provinces and functions, of course, retained at the federal level. The obvious things like defense, national transportation, and so forth. 
interestingly, <clears throat> of the in, in, in now in in the Bali government budget, budget spending about forty percent of spending is subnational spending, the provinces and the local governments. Of that, three quarters actually is with the local governments. Mm -hmm. So the bulk <clears throat> of spending. In Nepal, it has been decided it must be appropriately handled at the local government level. So, I suspect there are lessons there for for Myanmar too. That looking forward, future local governments, however constituted in the various states, will probably uh, need to assume quite large responsibilities for spending because the states and regions, certainly as they are now are very big entities with large populations, bigger than many countries in Asia. So really, the state and regional, the state and regional capitals are a long way away from, from ordinary people in the villages and village tracts. So the, the, the opportunities for giving responsibilities to future local governments, township or whatever level it is decided they be, are probably con considerable. And Nepal, which you also knew before, the Uh, the new constitution was adopted, has also moved from a very centralized, unitary structure, very top-down administration, to something that is now quite significantly decentralized. And uh, the question many Myanmar ask <coughs> are, yes, we can somehow see the vision of how we want it to be in the future, but how do we get there? How, what, what steps do we, can we make already now, where still there is a lot of uncertainty right now about the political outcome of this conflict, uh, but there are those who work already towards a new constitution. What could they do to put the right processes on track that will for sure take many, many years? Uh, what is the capacity that needs to be built? What can people already do now to prepare for this? Well, I think, I think w one important starting point is to understand how local government's arrangements are, are actually being implemented now in practice across the territory of Myanmar. And I think we know that there is a great variety of, of practice um, within and between the EAO controlled areas, <clears throat> within the um, NUG controlled areas, and, uh, and across the areas that, that, that SAC, the, the diminishing areas that SAC is controlling. I mean, I think it, it, it will be important to document what is going on there now, because in, in, in the, one never starts from zero, one never starts from a clean piece of paper. I think in, in any country, when you're building a decentralization uh, framework, you have to build on what is there. Mm -hmm. You can reform it, you can improve it, you can adjust it, but you have to start from, from what is there now. So I think understanding the, the here and now of practice and arrangement across the country, both What, what the institutional arrangements are in these different areas, what functions are being managed and how and at what level, what revenues are being collected, how and how they're being, being used and managed, and so forth. All of this, I think, was one key starting point. Um, relatedly, I think, moving toward vision, a vision or visions, because these may vary by state, of local government and local governance, building on, on what we know is there now, um, Uh, as I say, whether the, whether whether these are built around the township or clusters of village tracts or the district or whatever, and this may vary, some some common vision of local governments, future local governments arrangements, building on what works and what doesn't work from existing practice, they would that would be important. Mm. Um, we and we and we haven't really talked about the revenue, the financing side so far, Marcus, but just a quick word about mm. that. So. I mean, the starting point, uh, as any public finance person will say, the starting point for talking about fiscal decentralization is defining the functions, and that's what we've been talking about. What are the functions of subnational governments? Then you can start talking about how they should be financed. Many countries have made the mistake of doing things the other way around. This was the problem in Latin America in the 80s and 90s, giving local governments in Argentina <laughs> financing powers and borrowing powers without telling what they should be spending on. So you don't want to be doing that. So once you're clear what local governments and states should be spending on, then you're in a position to see, okay, how will this spend, how will this spending be financed? And financing, of course, is from two sources. The first source will be those tax and non-tax revenues which you want to assign to the states in the future, and indeed to the local governments within the states in the future. However, generally speaking, and this is 
universal experience, I think, generally speaking, the, the, the finance that local governments um, earn from their own revenue sources is never as much as what they need to spend. Mm. This is as true in Asia as it is in in the in you in Europe, and you see that in Denmark or Canada, the most decentralized countries in the world, the proportion of government spending is far greater than the, than subnational proportion of government revenues. So there is always a difference, a gap, uh, as as the um, public finance people say. There's a gap which needs to be filled, and this will be the same, I'm sure, in Myanmar. How do we fill this gap with transfers? with fiscal transfers from the center or the federal level, from the federal level's own revenue sources, which revenues can then be distributed across the country. And there are different ways this can be done. Such revenues as? Well, these can be from, from there, are, there are different ways this can be handled. Um, so you can, I mean, essentially there are two main types of transfer. I mean, there starting with the typology, the two main types. The first type of transfer is a revenue sharing transfer, where you take a revenue, like commercial tax, which indeed is now is being shared down under, under, under current arrangements, or was until 2021, 15% was going down in Myanmar to the townships of origin. Mm. Um, you start with a tax, it could be, as I say, a, a commercial tax, or it could be a natural resource rate of tax, and you say X percent shall be given back or retained by the area of origin. That's a revenue sharing transfer. The problem with that, before I go on to the second type, is that, of course, the revenues um, which are being shared often vary greatly across <coughs> localities within the country, particularly if we're talking about natural source revenues. So you end up with a real problem of difference between areas, which which you really have to deal, central government or the federal government will have to deal with later on. We'll pause on that one, come back to it. The second type of transfer is what we call a grant transfer, whereby whereby a, a part of central or federal government revenues are put into a pot and distributed across states, for example, or townships even, on the basis of some criteria or formula. Indeed, in, in Myanmar, there, there has been the general deficit formula, which uh, general deficit grant transfer, which since 2015 has been distributed according to formula across states and regions. And this, this obviously tends to be more equitable. And um, uh, so going forward, um, what, 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 what will be needed will be some thinking about the right mix of these transfer <coughs> instruments which revenue transfers and which sort of grant transfers will make sense, taking care not to perhaps be overly generous with the revenue sharing transfers, which can cause inequity. And once the problem is that once you've started, you've started the practice of sharing particular revenues, it can be very hard to go back mm -hmm. and reverse because people get used to it. Mm -hmm. This is the experience with Indonesia. Indonesia, 20-something years ago with the Big Bang, was very generous in sharing their natural resource oil and gas revenues, which then caused massive disparities between the regions, <coughs> which the grant transfers, the formulaic grant transfers, were not adequate to compensate for. Mm -hmm. But it became very difficult for central government to redress the balance because mm. there were there were had become vested interests in place which opposed any reforms, so best not to make uh, to be too generous too early if you mm. like on that front. Well, these are all things that uh, each one of these subjects could probably be something for another hour long discussion, uh, but we have to wrap it up uh, now. Uh, I want to thank you very much, uh, and we will certainly invite you again for future discussions, presentations. Uh, I also want to thank the audience for joining us today. Apologies for my voice, uh, but uh, we will certainly continue to provide uh, knowledge, uh, comparative analysis and experiences that can be useful for Myanmar constitutional designers uh, and governance uh, reform actors. Uh, but we believe that uh, uh, discussions like this uh, can contribute maybe to a broader understanding uh, of the roles and functions of local government and in that sense 
hopefully also help to improve uh, the situation in terms of services and access to <coughs> government uh, services uh, for the people of Myanmar. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, please leave your comments uh, below uh, and uh, give us your feedback. Thank you. Thank you.